All right, one more final example of the discrete time Fourier series. This time we're going to be taking a look at a periodic square wave. So here is the x of k that we'll be working with here. It's easiest to describe just uh, by a picture. This uh, discrete time signal x of k is kind of this periodic square wave that is on for a total of 2m plus 1 samples right here. So its total width goes from like minus m to m, but then it repeats this chunk of time every n naught samples. So there's a cluster here, then it, up at n naught there's the next cluster, and down at minus n naught there's the next cluster, and so on periodic for all time. So that's the signal we're going to be dealing with. And um, obviously since it has period n naught, we know what its fundamental frequency is. Omega naught is always 2 pi over the uh, number of samples in the period n naught, so that's our fundamental frequency. And we know how to compute the DTFS coefficients from the definition. This was the equation that we derived a few videos ago. So if I want to compute the DTFS coefficients, this is the equation that I need to evaluate, and in this case, for this particular signal here that I drew. So our job really in this video is how do I evaluate this equation for the particular case of this square wave as I've described in this picture here. So let's go ahead and start working on that equation. Um, one thing I can do is uh, remember in the DTFS equation here, I get to choose where my sum goes from. The only restriction is it has to be n not consecutive values, but where those values start doesn't, doesn't matter. I get to choose that. So for example, I could start my sum up here at time um, zero and sum all the way up to that value right there. That would be you know one full period. Or I could start you know, right here and then sum up to this value. That'd be n not total terms. You know, it's very much up to me where I get to start. Well, for this particular um, case, I actually think it's easiest to start right here at time minus m and then go up to one short of that edge. That will be a total of n not terms. So that's what I'm going to choose here for my limits. I'm going to go from minus m up to this point minus 1. I'm going to fall one short of that edge for a total of n naught terms. Again, you can tell that there are n naught terms because it's the top limit minus the bottom limit plus 1 is always the number of terms in a summation. And if you do that here, n naught minus m minus 1 minus a negative m plus 1, you get a total of n naught. So there are n naught terms in this sum. All right, what do I need to do? I need to take x of k and project it onto e to the minus jr omega naught k. So that's what I've done there. But right away, notice one thing that happens is my signal x of k is equal to 1 when it has a non-zero value, or it's equal to 0 outside of that. So in the summation from minus m all the way up to here, there are actually a lot of values that are 0. In fact, once I get to time m, that is the last time I have a non-zero value, and the values after that are zero, so I don't need to include those in the sum, so I've thrown those out of the sum. On this interval from minus m to m, I have one times e to the minus jr omega naught k. All right, so that's how that simplifies so far. I could probably just look this up in a table, but I don't uh, have that table around right now. I'm gonna use what I do know kind of from memory though. Let's just do a quick change of variables. Let's um, replace the counter k with the counter l. So I'm going to do a little shift. I'm going to let l equal k plus capital M. So if I'm going to do that, that means all of the k quantities, which there are three, this one, this one, and this one, all need to be swapped out for l quantities. So let's think through that. So first of all, just rearranging the equation, k is equal to l minus m. So this up here is going to get replaced with l minus m. What about the limits of the summation? When k was equal to m, if I plug into this equation, I get l equals m plus m, which is 2m. So this top limit's going to be 2m once I've switched over to l. Similarly, when k is a negative m, plug into this equation right here, a negative m plus m is 0. That means my lower limit is going to be 0. So let's go ahead and rewrite the summation now in terms of l's. So the bottom limit is 0, the top limit is 2m, and then e to the minus jr omega naught, and I replace k with l minus m. So that's what I've done right there. 
And now I can just use my property of exponentials. Um, the sum um, of an exponential argument is a product of exponentials. So I can split this into two pieces, one of which is e to the jrm, which I can, I'm sorry, e to the jr omega naught m, which has nothing to do with L, so I can pull it outside of the summation. And then I'm left with e to the minus jr omega naught L inside the summation. And this one has to stay inside the sum because I'm looping over L. All right, let me just go ahead and uh, rewrite that here so we know where we're starting from. Here's where we're starting from. Just rewrote it a little bit different. I raised it to the power L, which is a totally fine thing to do. And the reason I like it like this is we'll see here in a minute, this now kind of looks like a um, geometric series. And again, what are we computing here? We're trying to get an expression or evaluate the expression for the DTFS coefficients. So that's what I have for the DRs. We now would like to simplify this and get rid of that summation and just have an equation. So let's think through that. There's really kind of two cases here if, if you start playing with this. One of the cases is what happens when R is some multiple of n naught. So either zero times n naught or plus minus one times n naught or plus minus two times n naught, etc. Let's think about what happens um, to these exponential quantities when I have some multiple of n naught. Let's compute e to the minus jr omega naught because I, I have that right here, right? Right here, um, if r is a multiple of n naught, that might simplify in a special way. Similarly, this might simplify in a special way. Well, how, how does that actually happen? e to the minus j, if r is some multiple of n naught, I can write it like this, right? Little m n naught where m is some integer. And omega naught, by definition, is 2 pi over n naught. That's our fundamental frequency. So you can see something interesting happens, the n naughts cancel, and then I end up with e to the minus j, some multiple of 2 pi, which is 1. So for the case where r is a multiple of n naught, this equation right here simplifies quite a bit because this turns into 1, and this turns into 1. And my overall expression that I can write now, since that's 1, is 1 over n naught, the sum from L equals 0 to 2M of 1 to the L, which is just 1. And now this is a very simple summation to perform. I'm just adding up 1, a total of, well, how many terms are in this summation? It's the top limit minus the bottom limit plus 1. So 2M minus 0 plus 1 is 2M plus 1. So this is 2M plus 1 divided by N not out front, and I get this. So for the particular values of r being a multiple of n naught, the dr are equal to this. So that's one case where we can kind of see how this simplifies quite a bit. What about the other cases where r is not some um, multiple of n naught? That's the next case to consider. To do that, we have to use the fact that this is now a geometric series. So let's work on that. And this is just a fact that we have um, kind of memorized at this point or you can go Google it or look it up in a table. And this is why we performed that change of variable earlier because the one I'm used to kind of memorizing using always starts with the counter equaling zero and going up to some top limit. So starting at zero, going up to some top limit. So that's why I wanted to get this one into that exact form because now I can just use this equation to write down the closed form answer for this geometric series. So let's go ahead and do that dr equals, well, the stuff out front doesn't change, so still have that constant, but I can now just use this equation to write down the answer for this summation. So what do I do? I always write down 1 minus, and then I write down whatever is in here, which I've done, and then I raise that to this top limit plus 1, right? Because here I had n minus 1, and I ended up raising it to the n. I've added 1 to it. So here my top limit is 2m, so in this case, I'm going to write down 2m plus 1. Then what I do on the denominator, I do 1 minus whatever is right here, 1 minus alpha. So that's 1 minus this quantity. So at this point, I have a nice equation for dr. I could just stop here, but if we do just a little bit more work, we can simplify this into an even nicer equation. So let's do that. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work on this factor out front just a little bit. So I haven't changed anything. So this factor is actually equal to this factor, and you can see it as follows. 
e to the jr omega naught, 2m over 2, the 2's cancel, and I get right back to e to the jr omega naught m. However, I introduced an extra term of e to the jar, jr omega naught over 2, right? But guess what I did? I put that on the bottom to cancel out. So I haven't really done anything here except rewrite this in kind of a strange way, but you'll see why here in just a minute. So the first thing I did was just kind of rewrite that front term in kind of a strange way, but you'll see why. If you're fine with that, now let's just distribute this across. Okay, so e to the j or r omega naught times 1 gives me that term. And then this term times this term. Ooh, notice those are basically the same term. I just have half of it here and one of it here. So a half plus a negative 1 gives me a negative half of that quantity. Now let's work on the, the denominator. This times 1 gives me this right here. And then a very similar thing happens again. You can see why we started off with this kind of strange factorization. I have kind of one of those or half of those quantities here and a negative 1 of those. So a half plus a negative 1 is kind of a negative 1 half of those quantities. So I end up with this. And now you see kind of this nice symmetry that I have kind of an e to the jx minus e to the minus jx, e to the jx minus e to the minus jx. That should sound familiar. If I only had some two j's floating around, I could have some signs. So I, I'm going to force those in here in just a minute, but I'm running out of room. Let's go ahead and uh, rewrite that here on the uh, next slide, and we'll finish our simplifications. So this is just a write down from what we had on the previous slide. Okay, so nothing new here, just rewriting that down. But let's go ahead and do what I said. Let's force in a 2j. And then this divided by 2j is a sign term. Well, I can't just put a 2j there without changing things. If I put a 2j there, I need to put a 2j on the numerator to cancel out. And then look at that. This combined with this is also a sign. So if you do that, you end up with a sign on the numerator of this term, r omega naught 2m plus 1 over 2, and you also end up with a sign on the denominator of r omega naught over 2. So that is our expression now for dr when r is not equal to some multiple of n naught. You can also see now why breaking into the cases was important. If I just tried to evaluate this for r equaling some multiple of n naught, I would end up with a 2 pi in here, sine of 2 pi is 0, and I would have the same issue here. I'd have sine of a 2 pi factor, which is 0, and I'd end up with a form of 0 over 0, which is undefined. So that's why breaking it into those two cases earlier was an important thing to do. Note also here, this expression for the dr, this is completely real valued, right? A sine is real, this sine is real. So for this particular case, I ended up with real valued dr. In general, we know that the DTFS coefficients are complex, but in this case, we got a real value of dr because our original signal was even. It had even symmetry about the time origin. All right, let's take a little uh, look at what these coefficients look like. If you actually go plot the uh, DTFS coefficients for different values of the period and different values of m, this is what you'll see. So here, when m is 4, I have 8 values that are on and then I'm going to have it repeat every 50 total samples. I didn't show it repeat, but that's kind of what one cycle of this periodic square wave looks like. This is what you see for the DRs. This is what the amplitude spectrum looks like. Um, so I plotted the magnitude of the DRs, and it has kind of a sink-like behavior. It has this kind of rolling, scalloping roll-off. So that's one instance of what the uh, amplitude spectrum might look like for n not equaling 50 and m equaling 4. Let's look at one more example, though. Let's stretch things out a little bit. So same period. I still have n not equaling 50, but now m is 12. So I've stretched out further in time. So there are a total of 2 times 12 plus 1 equals 25 on values. And we know what happens due to kind of our time frequency duality. Stretching out in time compresses us in the frequency domain, and that's exactly what happened. My amplitude spectrum now is much narrower in frequency. These things roll off quite a bit um, faster. So 
So here on this chart, yeah, kind of kind of wide. And in the example when M was equaling 12, um, quite a bit narrower, as you can see right here. All right, so that's it for this example. We have computed the DTFS coefficients of a square wave using the definition. That is the last DTFS example. We're going to move on to talking about the discrete time Fourier transform, which is the transform we use for non-periodic discrete time signals. Thanks for watching.